is that what you're suggesting is that we create something called the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That was the whole purpose of creating that. Okay, and then, yes, they lose people's trust, but the idea was exactly what you just said. I, I think part of the problem with trust is something that's really concerned me over, over my lifetime, because I've seen people lose their faith in scientists. And if you compare the kind of trust there was in scientists when I was a kid, when everybody was way too trustful, now they've lost a lot of that. And I, I argue this with many of my colleagues uh, over to what extent, when you're a scientist, are you supposed to just tell you tell the things the way they are? To what extent do you have a responsibility for deciding the way they should be because you know more and then pushing that? My problem is that sounds good in principle, but when you do that, you lose people's trust. At that point, you, you're, not the, you're, not, you're not the arbiter, you're not the person who stands aside and gives the facts. You're now someone who becomes an advocate. And I, I, I think a lot of the loss of scientific trust has come about because of scientists feel that they have a responsibility. I know another professor in the physical sciences who feels it's his duty to t teach his students who they should vote for in the elections. I mean, my feeling, I, I, my proudest compliment was when a student came up to me and said, Professor Muller, can I ask you a personal question? Sure, you can ask. What are your politics? I, I think the student shouldn't be able to tell my politics. I, I, you know, I don't care if you're pro-nuke or anti-nuke, let's learn about nukes. Uh, but when scientists become advocates, and I say, I, I, I feel uncomfortable stepping over the line on nuclear waste storage. I, I, I actually think this trust issue is pretty seminal what we're talking about here. So you wave I'm, your arms when you're talking, the mic goes in and out. I know. So, uh, so who, I, just a quick poll of hands here. Who trusts the nuclear power industry in, in terms of delivering a safe, reliable product? Like, yes, if you, hand up if you trust them. You, you, you know, uh, one of our presidents said, trust but verify. So then, my follow-up... Trust the... Trust, uh, they used to say in my, my son-in-law's country... The, the alternating question is, who does not trust the nuclear power industry is delivering a safe, reliable product? So now, I, these are the people I want to talk to, actually. <laughs> so I, 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 uh, I think you just verify. You don't trust. Yeah, but uh, I, I don't... I, I would, didn't raise my hand for either side, because my feeling about it... Uh, who trusts big oil? <laughs> oh, but you all trust solar power companies, right? Wind power companies, you all trust people in pickets, right? Yeah. You know, this issue of, of do you trust or do you not trust, I think is the wrong way of phrasing it. How would you the, phrase it? I would phrase it the following. As a country, do we need nuclear power as part of the mix that we need to solve the problems? Do, does China and India need nuclear power? If so, how can we do that in a way that we will feel comfortable with? If you don't trust the current industry, fine. I don't care whether you trust them or not. What do we do? We, I think we should de decide on whether nuclear power should be part of the mix based on the relative dangers of the alternatives. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the argument that has a nuclear power plant and building that. Could you give the mic? I can't quite hear. So his, re his question is, what's your reaction to the fact that almost every country that has built a nuclear reactor ends up trying or building a nucle nuclear weapon. Oh, that's just not true. A very small fraction. And there are nuclear reactors all over the world, all over South America, you know, all over uh, Europe and, 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 uh, and Asia. And, and most of those countries have not done this. Just but, go but ahead and whether that nuclear question. proliferation is inevitable, okay. now that, I mean, people, nobody in the 1960s would have believed that the list of nuclear bomb countries in the year 2008 would be as small as it is. So something miraculously happened. It's just some kind of work. But people do worry that now that it's out of the bag, now that you have Pakistan and India and North Korea, that maybe things have changed now. And, and I think we have to be optimistic and forceful and try to hope that. But you've got to recognize that Iran has a legitimate reason for making nuclear reactors themselves and for having their own supplies of uranium that not dependent on the US. There are legitimate reasons for this. So the argument has to be 
that as a, as a world community, we decide to limit the spread of, of, of nuclear bombs. So we're just going to take a couple more comments and questions before we take a quick break. There was a question up here, just a second. Oh. Hi. <clears throat> so I'm trying to understand, I may have garbled it all in my brain, but you, I believe, stated earlier on that uh, solar and possibly wind were only viable alter a viable alternative for wealthy countries, not for or developing countries. Uh, that's the case right now. I know that. But then there's and more, so give me the mic back. Yeah. It's a little bit more complicated. China now is producing more solar cells than we are. But of course, they're using them for the, the things where they need the local power. It's not a replacement for coal. It, it, it's uh, there are lots of wealthy people in China too, uh, so uh, and and really what I'm not saying is that solar cells, as much as they cost today, is not something that China can really consider to replace their extensive coal burning. Well, well thank you. Okay, we'll talk more about later. Reaction to. Okay. Well, let me. Okay, for for a gigawatt plant, which is like a big nuclear plant, uh, the U.S. has 400 gigawatts total electric power. Uh, if you had solar plants that use that could, where the sun was out, you could do that with 400 square miles, which is 20 miles by 20 miles. With the sun that out, you need about four times that area. Okay, so, so it, it's not a huge amount of area. That's at a 10% efficiency as opposed to a 40% efficiency. It's not a huge area. All right, Let, let's take one more question and we'll... Okay, but... I know it's one of these, there it is. Okay, the whole credibility issue was really important. You were saying a moment ago, quite some time ago, that uh, uh, coal is, is really filthy for nuclear uh, for for power plants, and he says twice as filthy as natural gas. Three times. Yeah. And yet, your colleague Dr. Bill Wattenberg says that uh, natural gas is thoroughly clean, and he wants to have all cars converted to natural gas. So, is natural gas clean or dirty? So the question is, is natural gas clean or dirty? My colleague Bill Wattenberg. Well, he he's is, my friend, well, he and is, I think very highly of him, but... <laughs> well, he is, well, he is with... Well, he's a, no, it's actually at the Lawrence... He's a, a consultant to the Lawrence Livermore National Oh, Park. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, but, but I, I think I, he's, he, he is really one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. I, I really admire him a lot. He's usually pretty solid, but I, I think... I, I usually don't listen to him, uh, but uh, it, the fact is... It's not because he, he doesn't say the right things, it, 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 but anyway... He, uh, natural gas is three times cleaner. And T. Bloom Pickens says, let's use this as an interim step. To say it's absolutely clean assumes that when you burn it, you're going to capture the carbon dioxide and then sequester it under the ground. This is what, what uh, President-elect Obama calls clean coal. And we could do that with coal, too. People say clean coal is an oxymoron. No, it's not. It hasn't been demonstrated yet, but neither is cheap solar. Clean coal is something I consider a relatively straightforward engineering problem compared to the other alternatives. A lot easier than pebbled at nukes, for example. Uh, I, one of the things I think we need to do is to let people know that when we're talking about clean coal, we don't mean coal in which you are removing the sulfur dioxide, in which you're removing the mercury. Yes, that's the old clean coal. That sounds like the name of a song. The old clean coal, very old soul. Uh, that was, okay, the new clean coal, the clean coal that Barack Obama spoke about in the campaign with some degree of courage, I think, because most people hear that and say, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, he knows what he's talking about. The people who say he doesn't know what he's talking about don't know what they're talking about. Clean coal is this concept where if you burn the coal at the power plant, the carbon dioxide is right there, unlike automobiles, where the carbon dioxide is spread out all over the highways. If it's right at the power plant, you have an opportunity to grab that pump that underground. What's it going to do underground? Well, it turns out the U.S. and most of the world has lots of deep salt brines. The IPCC has written a special report on this. Deep salt brines is really salty water of no commercial value that anybody's been able to come up with. And if you pump this in there, we expect, we haven't proven it yet, but we expect it will dissolve and stay down there. 
at least until we have you know solar everywhere. It's a good interim step. So I, I think clean coal is something that we really have to look at very, very seriously. And this is one case where I know President-elect Obama uh, is ahead of the curve on it. We're, we're actually going to stop and take a quick break. I know there's a lot of people that still have questions. And I'm going to do my best to get to everyone before the, uh, before the time is up. But at this point, we're going to take a couple minute break so everyone can get more food, get something else to drink. You can do Atlas a big favor by bringing up your plates to this area that I'm standing at right now. And uh, we'll be back in a couple minutes of energy. It, it may very well be, but uh, I, I don't think you could find a single expert who would say that we would have a working nuclear power plant, you know, working on the grid in less than 25 or 30 years. So for the short term, the research is continuing. This is Eater plant that's under, under construction, will be tested soon. Um, it's big. It's huge. Um, some of you would not trust the kind of companies that you'd have to have to run something like that. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the main attraction of it is it's off in the future, and so you tend to think it's good. When things get close, as soon as wind power started getting practical, then there were many objections to it. It killed birds, it was noisy, uh, it, it, was, it made ugly, it looked ugly. Uh, and, and so I, I think- Is aesthetics a, a big part of our energy policy? How things look? Well, many, I think many people think it's not a big enough part. I mean, you know, we could mine a lot of, of coal. We don't because of the scar it leaves on the landscape. Uh, I think aesthetics is a big part of what we do. Um, and maybe it should be more, maybe some people, if, if you're really worried about energy independence and global warming, if those are your main issues, you may have to give up the aesthetics. Yeah, I, I do want to backtrack to some of the issues we were at before the end of the, uh, before we took a break. And one of the things that always kind of gets in, gets in me about energy is when you're talking about the, building these huge plants, that are far away from where we live, the energy has to still get to us. And I, I think the number that's always quoted is the transmission loss is about 50%. No, no, it's about, it's about 7%. 7%? Yeah, in the US. Seven, so from the nuclear plant to If, if we're 50%, right they'd there. build more power lines. <laughs> uh, the, these days, uh, power lines are just expensive. If you want to build a thousand mile power line, you can do that. Okay, but it costs you a billion dollars, or, or four billion. So it's, it's kind of like building a nuclear plant. So these power lines are expensive, and uh, T. Boone Pickens, for example, wants to use the wind corridor in the central U.S. and build lots of windmills, just wants the U.S. to pay for uh, the power transmission. Well, the, <laughs> the windmills are the cheap part, the power transmission is the expensive part, but hey, he's in it to make some money. So I, I mean, my end question is, does it make sense to build power where we don't live? Or is it like how we're starting to approach food? We should eat food local. Should well, our power the, 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 be local the, the, about too? The cheapest power we can buy these days is wind power. T. Boone Pickens is absolutely right on that. It just doesn't happen to be where people live. There are two places where we have lots of wind where people live. One is Southern California, the other is Texas. They are building uh, new wind turbines there as fast as General Electric can make them. General Electric is the only company in the U.S. that can really make these large wind turbines. By the way, a modern wind turbine, one built in Germany, is twice the height of the Statue of Liberty. These things are huge. So, um, likewise, if we're going to, you know, one thing you could do is you could dig coal from the Midwest and then, or from the West, and then transport the coal uh, and then burn it locally and make electricity, or you could do it do it where it is and then transmit the power. So, uh, lots of issues here. All right, we have a question back here. You're talking about um, wind energy. I had heard uh, at least a theory. I was wondering how viable it was of taking um, a wind propeller and actually hoisting it up into near the, up in the sky, basically using like helium balloons. Yeah, there have been some serious proposals to do that uh, recently. Uh, the, the main reason uh, you would do something like that is, as you know, if you've ever flown a kite, it's a lot more wind up there than there is down here. That's also the reason why you have these large windmills, you know, that are that are uh, 
800 feet high. It's big to take, to take advantage of that. So why not go all the way and put it up there? I, I think those proposals are the sorts of things that physics professors like to make. But if you consider uh, you know, the, the cable that has to support them coming all the way down to the ground, carrying that electricity, what happens if that snaps? Um, it, it, I, I, I regard it as technologically unlikely that we'll really do that. I like how you threw physics professors under the bus there, and you're a physics professor. <laughs> hey, I wrote a book, on, which hasn't been mentioned yet, which all of you want to go out and get. Well, physics for future Speak, presidents. Speaking of, so we are going. Uh, I want to give uh, Professor Muller to talk about credible sources of information because we spent a good deal of time talking about uh, trust and lack of trust. So I do want to give you a few minutes to talk about where good places to go for resources okay. for their education on this. The first one may surprise you. Wikipedia is generally excellent. It's the first place I will go on almost any technical question. I, I don't ask me how this has happened, but I have found that information amazingly reliable. So the good, the good news is, it's easy. Go to Wikipedia. Of course, you should buy my book. And, and then there are, there are the websites that specialize in more detailed information, like I mentioned the Federation of American Scientists which does a really, really good job on issues of, uh, issues of, of nuclear weapons, of, of, of uh, who, dirt, dirty bombs. Who are the Federation of American Scientists? What uh, is that group? It, it was a group of scientists that got together after the Manhattan Project to form a public interest. And they have really an impeccable reputation among scientists. And, and I think among even, uh, you know, even the people who are most skeptical of scientific authority uh, find that they really can't find fault with the Federation of American Scientists. It's a highly respected group by just about everybody. So, so I heard you wrote a book. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your wife is holding it up. Uh, uh, Physics for Future Presidents was, uh, came out of my class, which I teach at Berkeley, for, starting right after you took my class. I started this new course called Physics for Future Presidents, in which we would only talk about these kinds of issues. Namely, things that are obviously important. Right? There's nothing today, tonight that we talked about where anybody would ever walk out and say, well, why would President Obama need to know that? No, everything we talked about today is obviously very important. Well, one of the neat things about physics is that you can fill up an entire semester in which you never discuss anything which isn't obviously important. So after doing that for five or six years, seven years, I decided to write a book to reach out a little bit beyond the classroom. But you can also watch my lectures. They're all online. Uh, I, for the last two years, they're all, they're, all, they're all webcasts. You can see me lecture my students every day. He's not a bad lecturer. I've sat through a few lectures. Uh, we're going to come back here, and then I'm going to come up front to you. Uh, so we've talked about a mix of energy solutions, including like wind, solar, and, and nuclear. Uh, is there a magic formula? Like, what's the right mix? So uh, what, what do we need? What, what do you think the right mix is? Well, I have no idea because I haven't really looked at the economics. Or the well, do you think a mix is the right solution? I'm going to waffle on this and say I think we should do what's most efficient. <laughs> mm, the waffle. <laughs> well, I do people generally believe now that a mix is the right approach when it comes to... I don't, I don't think we're going to hear a lot of argument about this. Well, let me... Let me I, well, I'd like to comment on that because... I know you want to get the audience participating, but um, one thing we haven't mentioned here is energy efficiency and conservation. And the fact is, that is the big win for the near future. And this is helped by the fact that the McKinsey Corporation, which is a respected consulting firm, uh, finally came out with a report that verified what many of the scientists, so one of the lead advocates of this is my, my colleague Art Rosenfeld at Berkeley, and, and he's been pushing this for a long time. There is so much energy to be gained by using less that this is win-win. And uh, the McKinsey report showed in analyzing how we can reduce carbon emissions, by far the biggest winner was reducing the efficiency, I mean, improving the efficiency, reducing the emissions, leave the carbon underground where it belongs. And there's so much that can be gained here that if you, if, if you want to invest money, don't buy stocks. Go to your neighbor's house and say, 
I will reduce your electric bill in half if you'll give me half the savings. And then put insulation in the walls. Cover the paint with a nice brown paint that reflects the infrared radiation. Uh, the, 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 the roofs with the brown paint. There's so many things that can be done. So for the next 10 years, I think energy conservation is the big winner. But after that... Is that, that brown paint about the aesthetics of energy use again? Yeah, actually, Making all, all of our houses brown? Actually, it is. Because if you use white paint, it would be better. But people object to white paint. And you can make paint any color. We, it's called a cool paint. Look it up in Wikipedia. Cool paint. And, and actually, I don't know if there's an article there, but there should be. Maybe I'll write one. Cool paint reflects half of the energy, which is in the infrared. And so it doesn't affect the aesthetics at all. And if you want people to buy into this, you know, everybody wants their neighbor to do something nice, but they don't want white roofs on their neighbor's houses. But, but brown, green, any color you want. Cool cars. They're using these on cars now, so you don't need so much air conditioning. But this is what people call the rainbow, what other people call the wedge. If we're going to reduce the carbon and bring it back down, those show the various contributions that can come, top curve from efficiency, then from renewables, then from nuclear, and so on. You need them all. I, I really advise you, don't get into arguments with your friends saying, my green is preferable to your green. We need every green we can get. So, um, just want to ask you about another energy which was mentioned many years ago, and that was all about um, microwave energy. There was this theory that you could really concentrate from the sun and then beam through a microwave energy down, and it sort of just, maybe economically it doesn't make any sense, but could you just comment on that research and if there's any viability in that idea? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, most of the sunlight makes it to the surface. 70% of it does. So, to get an additional... 30% efficiency, you're going to put it in space and beam it down with microwaves. I don't think that ever made economic sense. I wanted to return to China and India that you mentioned earlier. I've, I've read the figure that China is building a coal-fired power plant at the rate of about one per week. Is that right? Yeah, actually 70 last year, so it's one, Seven, every, one every five days. One every five days. And that if, if China continues at that pace, that the... Um, that the rate of global warming is basically inexorable and unstoppable. I wanted to ask you first, is that correct? And second, what is China and India doing about nuclear power? Okay, it, it is correct. And if you look at this plot, what you'll see is here's the U.S. doing more than its fair share. Excellent. We're leading the world again. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> now you see uh, China and India doing its share. We can do feel-good measures. Let me give an example of what I call a feel-good measure. Uh, we're ashamed of the world by not uh, ratifying Kyoto, the Kyoto Accord. So let's ratify them. Let's bring back our power. Let's bring our power down to here. And, and, and really cut way, way, way back. Uh, that'll gain us, the total power will go down. This is actually the developing countries, but it'll be back up after three years. So it'll give us a three-year respite. Okay, and then it's gone. It, that's if we stay down here forever. So the problem is the developing world deserves to be developed. I'm in favor of them developing. Uh, but they're going to be, I don't want to call them responsible. I'm saying their carbon dioxide is what is going to cause global warming, not the U.S. We can cut back and feel good. You know, hey, I, drive, I drove a Prius here. Hey, I feel really good. To me, that is a little bit like you're, in the, you're worried about global poverty. And so you're walking through San Francisco and you see a beggar in the street. Instead of giving him a quarter, you give him 50 cents and then you feel good. Well, we can do all sorts of feel-good measures in the U.S., but I wrote an article that just appeared in Foreign Policy yesterday on what advice I would give President Obama, and one of them is you've got to, you know, you've got to make it clear to the U.S., to the people of the U.S., that we have to take, maybe we have to pay for it, pay for the cutting, for the carbon sequestration in China. They shouldn't have to pay for it, they're poor. But if we are the ones who are so worried about this, 
Anyway, and then, yeah, don't be poor, but by the time they're up, you see, we, they can say, oh, we, you know, let's set an example. We have set an example. The example we've set is that when you're wealthy, you can, you can use expensive clean power. If, if, if China does that same thing, then we'll have five or seven degrees of global warming. So, you know, setting an example doesn't really work. You asked about nuclear. They're building several new nuclear plants every year, too. But coal is dirt cheap. What's the, any reaction to that? Before I interject my own question. You said earlier that a coal plant was roughly comparable in expense to a nuclear plant. But then you just said coal was dirt cheap. Are you talking about building the plant or the source of fuel? Actually, the, the main expense in coal is transporting the fuel and then transporting the power out. Uh, it's, still, it's still the cheapest form of power in the United States. I mean, we pay here in California about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Many places in the US pay six cents a kilowatt hour because of, because of coal. How but much does nuclear energy cost by comparison? Who? Considering there have been no new plants built in the last well, no new ones approved in the last 30 years. Several have been built. Once you get a nuclear plant built, it's pretty cheap. It's really the expense of, of, of building the plant in the first place. So it's, very, it's, it's hard for me to compare. So, okay, so nuclear is a big upfront cost, and that's why China's not building more of them. It's just a lot of heavy upfront cost? You know, China is not being quite so logical, I think. Um, most of the plants, uh, the plants are, are you, have, you have an economy that is, you know, as a communist government in a capitalist economy, and very little in the way of controls over this. And all the provinces, the states, are building their own plants, and some of them without even pr approval from the central government, which wants to control pollution much more than the local areas do. So it's, it's a very hectic situation okay, so it's there. Chaotic. It's chaotic, okay. yeah. You know, I've actually been to a few Chinese coal-fired power plants, and they, they don't seem to be using the most up-to-date technology, let's just say. Uh, U.S. coal plants, for the most part, I, excepting a few, run on some fairly, are about as efficient as you can get. Would you agree? Well, uh, Close. There's some plants from the 70s that are not. The old ones are not. The new ones are. Efficiency now is an important thing. It didn't used to be when electricity was so cheap. But, but now, uh, now we, I think the, av the average in the U.S. is about 20, 25 percent. The new plants can up, get up to 40 percent. Where in, in China, it, there seemed to be a lot of uh, the flu stream that would just fly out that was not... Oh, when you're talking about old, clean coal, yeah, yeah uh, th that's something that uh, I think China's going to do. Uh, they're going to do that, the great embarrassment of the Beijing Olympics, of all the smog. People, everybody who goes there knows how terrible it is. But that's an immediate health problem. See, if I were the premier of China, I would certainly worry about that. But am I going to slow down my economy because of one or two degrees Fahrenheit of global warming? I think if I were the premier of China, I'd say, i got to worry about the education of my people first, about their health, about their well-being, about their opportunity that let, let it get warm a few degrees. I'm not going to slow down my growth. I fear that's what I would say if I were the Chinese premier. Okay, so if there's all this dirty industry, you know, uh, with, with dirty coal behind it in China, how much could we modify the upward curve if we were to just not buy all the products? Who are the, which of the countries in the world are the ones that are buying all these products that are coming from this, this yeah, dirty it's industry? It's, it's us. Right, so why aren't we putting in place some sort of... Well, we, we, we could do that. That could be a policy change. I mean, the downside of that is we would then be slowing the, the liberation of the people of China. We do, the, the, the health, the uh, economic well-being, the equal rights for women, all those things would suffer because we're boycotting China. But it would reduce global warming. So now we're balancing two things where everyone in this room might balance them differently. One thing we glossed over since there's a carbon dioxide slide up here, uh, nuclear plants uh, do release a lot of water vapor. Yeah. Correct? That's right. So uh, what is the contribution effect of water vapor, which is considered sort of kind of a greenhouse gas well, uh, water vapor, comparatively? Uh, water vapor is the major greenhouse gas. 
When you emit more water vapor from a nuclear plant, it does not change the water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, the reason is that, simply said, you know, the, 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 the world is covered two-thirds with oceans. And so it's that equilibrium between the oceans and, and, and the atmosphere that determines the water vapor. So although we put water vapor into the atmosphere, we don't actually change the amount of water vapor. Now, carbon dioxide is very different. We have increased the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by 35%. That will eventually become equal, come into equilibrium with the oceans, but that takes, 35, that takes about, uh, about, well, 300 to 1,000 years. Whereas you're saying the, the water, the water is, is right away, yeah. So I have a naive question. Why aren't we promoting the use of nuclear power plants around the world? That would seem to cut down on the carbon think, dioxide emission. I, I think any politician who did that would lose a lot of votes in the U.S. McCain did that. Barack Obama was more cautious. I don't think McCain lost because of that statement, though. Let's just I be didn't honest. say he did. <laughs> but do you think he lost any votes because of that? Well, what do you guys think? You, I mean, we heard McCain say it in the third debate. Okay. Anyway, this is mm. this is not physics anymore. So let's not get into a political discussion. What? Well, we're here for the discussion. You're here for the physics. <laughs> I mean, it is pertinent. I mean, in this issue, no, you can't I, I separate. Think the following is true. I think the following the is true that if. That, that it's dangerous to a politician to be a nuclear advocate in the United States today because so much of the public uh, is right now convinced. I think once you're elected, then you have the opportunity of educating the public. But right now, so much of the public is convinced that nuclear waste is an unsolved problem that to become an advocate like that, you, you're, 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 it's politically dangerous. Um, I've got a, I would like you to comment on this. In uh, Germany, as you probably already know, they've been one of the biggest uh, solar expansion, creating huge hundreds of, hundreds of jobs, thousands of jobs, uh, because they changed their economic policy to all the people saying, if you don't produce solar, we're going to really you know, cost right. you a lot of money. So every house, even people pay pig farmers to put solar on over the sheds. Right. So walls, everything's been covered in solar and they're creating the whole industry. And I always, when I look at the U.S., I say, here's a good example of how people could be forced to do the right thing. Well, we're doing and that in California. AB 32 yeah. is basically a law saying there's that we a, have to produce there's 20... A there's a whole country that was, you know, the whole country's got into this whole thing. But California's right? as big as Germany is. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that makes my point. That makes my point. So, no, therefore... So, so we're, we're doing it in California, too. And, and that'll work fine for us wealthy countries, because we can afford to do it. But it won't work in China. Well, here it could work, sure, and we could reduce our emissions and delay global warming by three years. So, if you're saying that you know we're talking about the right thing, what isn't there still significant risk to the people working in the plants? Maybe not to the general public who would not be exposed to it, you know, uh, inhaling it, but actually the people who are working there. Okay, uh, I think in all industry there's risk. I think the biggest risk in the nuclear industry comes from the old-fashioned kind of accidents, you know, falling pieces of concrete and 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 electric and people running into. I, I, the, the 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 risk from well, there's a there's a wonderful story that is is actually true about a guy who was uh, leaving a nuclear reactor and was loaded down with radioactivity, uh, uh, and so they cleaned him off. And he left. The next day he came back. And when he left, he was loaded with radioactivity again. They kept on trying to find it. They couldn't find it. Finally, they discovered it was radon in his home. And he was getting radioactive at home, walking into the plant when they didn't test. And then when he came back out, being tested, they would not have found that if they weren't doing all this testing. So I think the radioactivity for the workers in the plant is really not much of a risk because it is so carefully monitored. It really is. So I'm actually going to bring up something that uh, I've heard kind of mentioned in passing as I've walked around, which is Three Mile Island. And even though it's been almost 30 years now, right? And uh, I think, I, I'm curious, do, does every, do people here remember Three Mile Island? Unless you're over 40, you're not going to remember it. <laughs> but I mean, there's two seminal nuclear moments in our lifetime, and that's Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. In your lifetime, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, fine. In my lifetime. 
And uh, you're not that old. Do you remember it? No, I was. I didn't I was, think so. <laughs> okay, I didn't think. But so. I, I, I remember it. Re I read about. It. Yes. You remember it. What do you What do you remember about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I lived in New York. I was going to school, and what I remember is a panic among my friends and a bunch of people driving down to Florida <laughs> to escape the radiation plume. So what happened? Okay, well this, this was a different kind of accident and it was, was basically a nuclear meltdown and it caused an overpressure in the reactor and so they released some of the radioactivity to the outside. The amount that they released, again, just like Chernobyl, you can calculate the radioactivity of Chernobyl will lead to 24,000 deaths. You can calculate the release from uh, Three Mile Island will lead to less than one death. Um, but people say, okay, so it didn't happen, but it could have. It came so close. The real worry about Three Mile Island was, can you trust these guys when this actually happened? It happened to occur right after the movie The China Syndrome was released. And that really amplified the fear. Walter Cronkite uh, talked about, about Three Mile Island as the worst industrial accident that had ever occurred. And, and, you know, and he was the most trusted man in America. But, um, uh, I, I calculated once that there would be more than one death, but it wasn't from the radioactivity, it was from the people evacuating uh, the fear, uh, maybe from smoking, because they were so worried about the radioactivity. Okay, so since we didn't have enough things to worry about, now you've got me wondering about the radon gas. Should we all be out getting these test kits? Radon gas is actually, I think, the most serious radioactivity worry in the United States. Uh, there are some houses that you should not live in uh, because ra radon comes from the radioactivity of uranium in the ground. Some places like in Denver, oh, here's a little story too. The, the, the Department of Energy put together a efficient house, a display house in which they had arranged it so the air, for example, would not be dumped outside and cool air would come in where you would have to where you would have to uh, 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 heat it. Instead, they had recirculating air, but done in such a way that it was cleaned and made dry and really comfortable. This was their energy efficient house. It turned out to be the most radioactive house in America that has ever been measured. The reason is the radon gas would seep up, and instead of leaking out, you want a drafty house if you're afraid of radon. Uh, it, would, it would circulate on the inside. Radon does come. It, it gets trapped in the filters, a lot of it. You can, some filters in some homes, you go up to them with a garden counter and you, can, you can, can measure the radon. I don't believe radon is a big problem in the Bay Area. Okay, but in Denver, there are some places where, where, where it's a concern, and I, I can't give you the map, but I, look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> or the FAS or something like that. I, I'm going to backtrack one second, and that's um, in your book, you mentioned what the president needs to know about radioactivity. And that's the reason I brought up Three Mile Island. What does the public need to know about radioactivity if there is a dirty bomb that's set off in the middle of Manhattan? Or if there's an accident in a nuclear reactor? What, what, is the, what should we know? Well, there are two dangers of radioactivity. One is radiation illness, and the other is the increased chance of cancer. Now, the, the numbers are this. Uh, uh, the, the, I measured in REM, the, the dose that you get. So uh, up to 100 REM, you don't even feel ill. And that, that's what makes a dirty bomb so difficult to make work. Because if you spread out the radiation enough so that everybody gets no more than 100 REM, there won't even be any dead bodies at the scene, not even any sickness. There will be a spread of cancer. So the thing you need to know is that at 100 REM, uh, the cancer dose is basically, if you get 100 rem, don't feel ill, your can chance of cancer has gone from 20% to 24%. That's pretty bad. That's at 100 rem. Okay, at, uh, let's see, did I get the number right? It's 100, uh, yeah, it's, it's 4%. So uh, if this radiation leak, ask yourself how many rem you're going to get. If it's 100 rem, 
the government wouldn't let you stay. I mean, that, that's really, really bad. Some people will get ill. Uh, and your cancer is going up by 4%. If it's one rem, which is also considered really horrific, way above the threshold, then your chance of cancer is 1% of that. It's not 4%, it's 0.04%. Your chance of cancer goes up from 20% to 20.04. My own personal feeling is that if I were asked to leave my home by the government, because they don't want my chance of cancer going up from 20% to 20.04%, I wouldn't want to leave. I'm willing to live with that rather than give up my home. So the fact is, when you consider the other, I mean, I, I, the, the increases in cancer that you can get from the spread of radioactivity, for my own decision, personally, I would rather take that slight increase in cancer and not disrupt my life. The radiation illness is a more serious thing. If it's over 100 rem, you'll get sick. You want to get out of there before it happens. This is the whole issue of fallout from nuclear, from nuclear bombs. Uh, people would get sick and die. At 1,000 rem, you'll die within a few hours. And at 100 gram, you don't die at all. It's really odd. There's a threshold. What do you think? What's the background radiation generally? About a third of a rem. A third of the background radiation here in our lives is about one third of a rem per year. So, so if I could ask about, uh, you mentioned uh, dirty bombs are a big threat because it's there would be no bodies in the street and that sort of thing. So as a as a as a terrorism sort of thing is. Is it really all that effective? Because part of the terrorism is the, to co-opt a phrase, the shock and awe of it. Well, uh, let's take the case of Jose Padilla, the Chicago street thug who was trained by Al-Qaeda, came to the United States planning on building a dirty bomb, was arrested. And in the deposition, what we learned was Al-Qaeda contacted him and said, forget the dirty bomb idea. Rent several apartments in different apartment buildings in Chicago and explode them using natural gas. So what scares me about this story is that Al-Qaeda understands this issue better than a lot of politicians in the U.S. Excellent. So I, I do want to, uh, we're starting to, uh, we're about to run out of time. So I do want to ask kind of a general question to the audience because I think this is pertinent. Are you a believer in nuclear power? Again, I, I phrase it in a way that I'm sure Professor Muller doesn't enjoy. But is there something that... That, is there something that you're walking away with tonight that changes your perception of nuclear power? And I want to hear yes or no. You've been silent. I'm going to pick on you. Don't, don't pick on her. So I came in here unsure of how dangerous the waste from a nuclear reactor was. And I was aware that France had been doing this for a long time. But apparently no ill effect and we hadn't been doing it and I was concerned about that so having heard you speak about the waste uh, this is no longer something that I'm terribly concerned about. A quick comment on France there's a saying in France that is no coal no oil no choice. How about uh, anyone else did their perception change at all unaffected? No one wants to talk to me in the back here. Well, I, I, I personally walked in and said, um, I, I, I kind of expected this. Like I expected that uh, that the waste issue, the science was purely behind that nuclear power was a reasonable alternative with appropriate safeguards. And my my reasoning hasn't changed at all. And in fact. Uh, I'm more inspired to actually reverse the the sentiment against nuclear power now than I was two hours ago, because it seems like everything that we've talked about scientifically points to nuclear power being a reasonable alternative. But then we've talked about that is cont contrary to that is trust, credibility, uh, political will. Those are things that I think can be reversed through uh, action. I mean, that's my own personal feeling. I, I'm open to hearing other people's sentiments. Uh, what would you say to President Obama? To It sounds to me from just this discussion that people, are, whether they agree or not agree, but there's a discussion here. What would you say to him to, to on a national scale to talk about these um, nuclear power? Because that seems to be the big problem, that people aren't informed. They have a lot of myths, a lot of misunderstandings. Obviously, there's politics behind it. And it seems like that was a major thing he could do as far as an energy policy. I, I think what 
I've, I've written articles about this. I, I would really like to see President Obama have a monthly fireside chat in which he says, for the next hour, we're not going to be political, we're not going to be partisan. I just want the public to know what the experts think about some issues. It could be global warming, it could be nuclear power, it could be clean coal. It would be done in such a way, which I think can be done, in which you wouldn't, the Republicans wouldn't feel obliged to come up with a response because you can make it nonpartisan. It's just a matter of informing the public. Think of it as an infomercial if you want, but it has to be done right. I would love to see President Obama lead the country into saying our problems are too serious for you to let us do it on our own. We need to educate you. I'd love to see something like that take place. Big believers in the fireside chat. Well, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, in a lot of this talk about plutonium and uranium and all that, you're talking about uh, chemicals that have long half-lives. And I remember reading something about some guy who was smuggling a, um, a sample of uranium to somebody to show that he had access to uranium, and he had this thing in his pocket. And so it led me to believe, well, okay, if you're talking about things that have long half-lives, then you're talking about very slow decay. So it's like the 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 kinds of stuff that are being used in nuclear reactors are the safest kind of radiation that's available compared to stuff like radium and stuff like that and people's watches that have a half-life of like three years or something. So it would seem like, if anything, with all these various you know kinds of nuclear chemicals and stuff, the stuff in the nuclear reactors is among the safest available, isn't it? Well, it depends on whether you measure the safety over the next hundred years or whether you measure it over the next million years. You know, over a million years, uranium can kill lots of people. Over a hundred years, it's, it's these other elements that do it. So, I, you know, it, it, it works both ways. There's something that's highly radioactive gets rid of it very quickly if you store it, and if it gets out, can make you sick. But you're, you're raising, I think, an excellent point, which is that uh, some people say that the trouble with plutonium is because it's such a long-lived radioactivity. Well. Uh, aside from the solubility in water issue, long-lived isn't necessarily bad. As you say, uranium-235 has a billion-year half-life. Uranium-238 has a four-and-a-half billion-year half-life. So uh, you know, I wouldn't be afraid to handle uranium in my hand. It's, the chemical of the uranium is more dangerous than the radioactivity because its half-life is so long. Put it in a nuclear reactor, put it in a bomb, and you can get every atom to explode in a short time through the chain reaction. But normally it's just not, it's not even warm. We have, we have time for one more question, if anyone has a question. Oh, perfect. Oh, right there, my wife has a question. <laughs> I'll top it off with the silly question. Um, they always show nuclear waste being this glowing green liquid. What does it really look like? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, radium uh, is uh, glows, uh, Madam Curie saw that glowing uh, in, in, in the dark, and that's given us our image of, it, of its glowing, but the radium there was, was really extremely dangerously radioactive. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it was enough that, what, what radioactivity is when the nucleus explodes, and the particle that comes out is, is typically an electron or an alpha particle. When that hits the air, it'll give off a little bit of light. If the light is enough that you can see it, then get out of there. <laughs> but, but, you know, typical radioactive things, uh, a nuclear reactor, I, I, you can look down into a nuclear reactor underwater, you can see, and it's glowing. But nuclear reactors are billions of times more radioactive than anything we get. Uh, there's nothing, radioactive material is used in hospitals, uh, it's used for CAT scans, it's used for PET scans. PET scans are positron emission tomography. They actually use antimatter in hospitals. None of that stuff glows. Uh, the radioactivity that you need to get to glow is, is well, as I say, Madame Curie uh, had material that hot, but, but not anymore. Well, with that, I want to thank Professor Mullen for coming out tonight.
I do want to plug one thing, and that's uh, something you recommended 12 years ago that I think is still good. There is a PBS Frontline on nuclear power. It's called Nuclear Reaction. I think you can still see it online. I highly recommend it. It goes over a lot of the basics. If you're thinking about how can I talk to my friends about it in a way that's very responsible, it's, it's very cool. They even, uh, I remember this one point where they put a piece of plutonium uh, down and actually block the radiation with a piece of paper. Uh, it was very interesting. And uh, the last thing I say is, if Homer Simpson's been on TV for 20 years and he survived working in a nuclear power plant, I think uh, I think it bodes well for all all of us. Uh, if you haven't signed up for the mailing list, it's there on the uh, the counter by the beer tap. Sign up. Uh, Donate if you if you like the series. All of the money that uh, goes into the donation jar up front just goes to uh, paying for advertisements and uh, keeping it alive. And we'll be back January third Monday in January, whatever that date is. Look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you.